So, uh, good evening, everybody. You're all very welcome to Ballina Fringe Festival's So You Want to Be a Writer, a uh, writer's workshop with uh, two Mayo writers, Maureg Prunty and Mike McCormick. Uh, we're going to start off by um, having the guys introduce themselves. So, do you want to go first, Mike? Uh, thank you, Sean. Uh, good evening, folks, and uh, welcome to this Fringe Festival. Uh, as Sean said, my name is Mike McCormick and I am from the west of Ireland. Um, my parents, I was born 55 years ago, um, but like, and like many another male man of that generation, I was actually born in London. My, my mum is from up your part of the country, up to Homa in north, northwest Mayo, and my dad is from south Mayo, from Lewisburg and that. And um, very... It, one of the things we share to myself and Maureg share together, pretty humble working class backgrounds. We would have both been, I, I certainly am the, work, the first of my generation to go to university and um, first to, to, to ever kind of step up, step into that world. I was, uh, I was raised in Lewisburg and um, it was a, it was an upbringing where I was taught by nuns and priests and uh, um, in and in a little convent co-ed school, and I was about as about as normal and, and as 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 orthodox a young fellow as you could meet. I was a uh, an altar boy and a GAA player, and um, pretty pretty ordinary. And come from a, a small farm background, um, and it was only when I went away to university that I that I started to to write and to take seriously the possibility that maybe I could write, and that maybe it was an okay idea for someone with my background to have notions of being able to write. And um, I suppose one of, the, one of the smart things I did was I managed to harness my background uh, at that age and, and make use of it. I, I kind of instinctively felt that, okay, my background is something I can use. My small farming background, Lewisburg and everything. So that eventuated in, I'm the author of uh, two collections of short stories and three novels. Most recently, my last novel is called Solar Bones. And at present, I teach in NUI Galway. I teach creative writing with my colleague, uh, Morag. Okay. Perfect, Mike. Before uh, you tell us about yourself, Morag, uh, I just want to tell everybody attending that uh, we are recording this session. And, um, at the end of the session, hopefully there will be an opportunity for questions. So if anybody does have any questions, then you can use the chat function. Uh, sorry, Morag, if you could tell us a bit about yourself. Okay, uh, my mother is here and she'd be scandalized at the idea that Mike uh, described my background as a humble working class Irish background because actually my parents were both teachers. Uh, my mother comes from a long line of teachers um, who were resolutely middle class. Uh, from my mother's generation up and then my father came from a farming background but he was a teacher also so I grew up um, with books and uh, and also with the idea that writers were like gods in our house you know this was it was a completely unaccessible thing um, but it was uh, my parents were very very strong on uh, academia and education and um, uh, but basically, I failed miserably in school, uh, was thrown out at 15 and began work as a hairdresser. So I suppose certainly my literary uh, background is very, very humble indeed. Um, so, um, yeah, I went from being a hairdresser and then uh, just had always been very creative, wrote myself and uh, gradually over the years through getting breaks and talking to people and getting lucky, I managed to uh, very young break into the world of magazine publishing. Um, and uh, then through magazine publishing, I think in a, um, I, all that time I was writing creatively as well, writing, I'm a ferocious writer. <laughs> I just write constantly. And uh, just through being very prolific, um, I had my first novel published in 2000. And I've written, well, I've written a lot of novels since then, but I've had about 10 published. And um, not all of them are terrible. 
but none of them are as fabulously uh, literary and groundbreaking as Mike's books. Uh, but I call myself a hack. I call myself more of a Grub Street hack, um, certainly than a literary writer. Um, I've written comedy books. I've written, um, you know, good historical fiction. I'm classified as, um, uh, what am I classified as? Uh, quality commercial <laughs> and I'm also um, I'm writing for television and film I'm constantly kind of changing and moving genre and experimenting and um, I the last um, in the last few years I've discovered teaching I've been lucky enough to get some um, to get some regular work up at NUIG and um, that's I suppose if you like that is certainly my second passion teaching so I call myself a writing evangelist and my audience largely are the um, students at NUIG. So that's me. Excellent. Thanks, Morag. Um, guys, at what point in your lives did you realise that you wanted to be a writer? Um, I'll, I'll take it up for a minute there. Yeah. It, for me, it was my heroes were always were quite recognisable during my during my my teen years. There's certain things I wanted to do. I wanted to be a footballer. I wanted to play for Mayo. Um, I was a decent. I was a decent GAA player. Good club player. Um, good enough to go for county trials, but not good enough to make the team. Um, so that was something I was good, but not quite good enough at. And I wanted to be. You know, I still have a notion that I confront a heavy metal band. I wanted to be. Uh, I wanted to be. I wanted to confront a heavy metal band. Um, but the other thing, the other thing, the only, the only other thing that really set me apart as a, as a teenager was absolute voracious reading. I read left, right and centre and I read all the books that a kid reads, but the, the ones that really set it, that lit me, lit a fire in my head were my dad's cowboy books. Um, the books of Louis L'Amour and J.T. Edson. And I'd say there's literally, you know, I'd say there, there's there's isn't a house in our in the west of Ireland in which a handful of those books haven't passed through but in my in my upbringing there was literally scores of them in our house and I read them and and I thought it was a wonderful thing to be I thought it was a wonderful thing to be sitting in the west of Ireland and to be reading about the Mojave Desert and to be reading about these cowpoke towns and to be a gunslinger and everything like that I thought that was such a, a, a wonderful enchantment and that was where my reverence for writing and writers was birthed on that. Now, there was a big leap from that to me thinking I could do it. Um, I didn't really think I could do it and didn't really think that it was given to lads from the west of Ireland who were brought up around stone walls and wet sheep and wainlands and things like that. I didn't think that that was given to, didn't think that that was given to people like me. But I read a very important essay in my early 20s. I read a brilliant essay by the great American postmodern writer Thomas Pynchon. And he wrote an essay in which he, he showed all his misgivings and all his false starts and all his shynesses and bashfulness. And I read it and I thought, this is me. This is me he's talking about. And once I read that essay, I thought, well, if it's okay for the great man to feel like that, it's okay for me to feel like that. And that essay was, um, it's, it, for those wanting to read it, it's, it's the introduction to Slow Learner, um, the opening essay in Slow Learner. And, um, and that was it. And I came across that at about the age of 21 or 22. And I think that was it. That was the beginning for me. What was it for you, Mark? What was it? Well, it was, it was, it was really strange because when, when I was growing up, I always, I was very creative. So I always, um, you know, I was always doing creative things. So I did a lot of drawing. I used to write poetry. I did ballet dancing. I did acting. I took up the cello for a while. And all of these things, my brother, um, when I was growing up, I had a brother who was a year younger than me. And he was kind of like a music prodigy. So I would try all of these things, but no matter what I do, I was never as good at him. I was never as good as he, as he was at music. And then, uh, uh, I, I, I had an awful teenage years. I left school very young. I was a disappointment to everyone, including myself. I was working as a hairdresser. You know, I, uh, just as a young woman, I was a mess. And I was sharing a flat. 
I was 18 and I was sharing a flat with this, um, we were fairly wild girls um, in London in the, in the 80s. Uh, with this girl Sophie and we used to just I mean we were two 18 year old girls living in a flat in London on our own we were we I mean I don't know how we survived but we were out and about and everything and we used to go off and have these adventures and I um, was very talkative and I would be you know telling these stories about you know gossiping and talking and talking and one day she said to me I don't know if she was fed up with me talking she said why don't you just write that down it'd be really funny and I started to, I, I started to write, I started to write little anecdotal pieces. And um, I discovered, um, I, she then got a friend of a friend of hers who was a journalist who was, um, I don't know, he was in his thirties and he would ask if, he was asked if he'd like to help a young 18 year old journalist. And uh, you can imagine his answer was, yeah. <laughs> so this, guy sat down and he looked at my writing and he said you're really really good and it was literally from then on I I pushed and I pushed I started to get things published and it was quite easy for me to get things published so my desire to write really came out of this kind of youthful discovery that this was something that I could do this was something that I was good at but I'd never been good at anything and now I found something that I was good at. Um, I found my voice very quickly. Do you know, I had no education, I had no background, I had nothing to lose. I was just writing, I began getting work in teenage magazines, uh, which was a very big deal at that time in London. You know, Just 17 and Smash Hits and More Magazine. Um, so very, very quickly, very, very young. I kind of exploded into this world with this um, ability and this voice. Um, and then as the years went on, um, you know, I changed and I got literary aspirations and I started to write, but th it was that, it was that basic thing. And I, and I often think it's something that I talk to my students about a lot is finding your voice, you know, and schools do not help you find your voice. They really don't. Uh, so that's kind of my mission when I'm teaching is to get these and say, if you find your voice, it'll be easy. Yeah. Then, it, then it becomes easy. And I feel like even when I look at, you know, when you're reading a book and you can hear somebody's voice, you can hear their natural voice and what they're writing. Um, it's there. For me, my natural voice was in the first article I ever wrote for Just 17. I was incredibly lucky. Your voice was so indisputably in solar bones. It was so immediate and apparent that that was your pure voice speaking. I think, yeah. Do you I, know? It's, it's, I think that's a really important, it's a really important kind of a, a lesson or it's a really important path to push young writers, to point them towards is, is find your own voice and you and for me I found it through for me I found it through reading other writers mm -hmm. um and it gradually came to me via other writers I, I you know I, I say this and it sounds like a joke or, or a story but it, but it but it's really true when I at the age of 18 19 20 21 I discovered that you know I discovered the writers that birthed me and they were people like John McGahern, Philip K. Dick, and J.G. Ballard, and all of that, and and um, and I loved, I loved McGahern because I recognised my own background in McGahern's work, the small farm. But then, but then there was in Philip K. Dick, there was all this cosmic paranoia, and there was Martians and spaceships and robots, and I wanted that as well. And and then in then in in J.G. Ballard, maybe my favourite short story writer, there was this this kind of just near future psychological meditation and, and that. And, and, and I've said to people, like I said, back at that age, I, I found my, when I think of it, when I think of it like through no smartness, just by sheer blundering, I came upon the idea that if, if, if these three writers came together at a crossroads <laughs> in West Mayo and had a bastard offspring, a love child, then it would be me. Because I, I wanted, I wanted to, I wanted to, 
you know, I, I, I profess to see that there wasn't enough McGahern in Philip K. Dick and there wasn't enough Philip K. Dick in, in McGahern and, and I wanted J.G. Ballard as well. So I figured that I could, I could fit all of those together in me. And, and that was, that was, the, that was the, 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 the part, that was kind of my starting point uh, as, as, a, as a writer on that. Um, and hence all my work is very kind of, it's very grounded in West Mayo and then it goes out, then it goes haywire. It's uh, yeah. on the ground and then it goes haywire and that. Did you have any heroes when you were, did you have writerly heroes that? Well, I'm always you? fascinated when I hear other writers um, and, and in particular uh, literary writers, because I, 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 the books that I have written, um, uh, my writing is very, very separate in a lot of ways from from my reading. Like, I mean, if when if I re if I read something um, for influence, it's usually in a very kind of deliberate and cognitive way. Like, how is this book structured? You know, um, my writing heroes were P.G. Woodhouse. Yeah. I loved comedy. Like, so I love P.G. Woodhouse. I love Tom Sharp. Um, I loved. Um, Oh, who was the guy that wrote? He was like Pat McKay before Pat McKay. He wrote Foggage. And Patrick McGinley. Patrick McGinley. I loved yeah. him. I loved Tom Sharp, all yeah. of those books, and a huge consumer of, uh, of Agatha Christie. And yet, the books that I've written, I would probably with the exception of the early Moro Plunty books, that were kind of like, they were quite, high, they were very like Tom Sharp, actually. They were very um, high octane comedy books but they were marketed as, as chick lit and the chicks didn't, <laughs> chicks didn't, weren't impressed. But then I've written historical fiction, you know, very, very heavily researched historical fiction. And I don't believe, I've, I've no interest, I've no influences or interest in that whatsoever. My writing comes entirely from a wellspring of interest and a voice inside me. It's very strange. Like I've no, um, I don't, I love McGahan. Do you know yeah. what I mean? I love Edna O'Brien. I've read her early books. Like I've read yeah. and I've read voraciously when I was young, but I can't, um, I never had any understanding or of, of emulating them or them influencing me although I suppose they must have yeah you know? well, I think I'm more influenced by the voices in my family by my mam and my auntie and yeah you know. that, that's that is something that can and, and I, I actually come from a I come from a on, on both sides of my family is they're singers uh, they can all hold a tune, and 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 my father was a brilliant mimic as well, as as it, as is my brother to this day, and that and so much of and and my brother has written, you know, there's a story called um, the man from God knows where, uh, uh, and that and really it's just my brother, you know, my, my, his voice and that. One one thing you said there though that I recognised as being really important in, in myself when when I was growing up. Was developing more like was you talked about reading a book and and kind of taking it apart to see how it was structured and built and everything is like I, I can I can remember doing that particularly to short stories I, I would I would I would kind of catch myself in the moment of awe or in the moment of envy and and that's what it is to be a reader but to be a reader writer you go back in and you go how is this built how is it put together? Was was did you have did I, like I I had in my early twenties I had a, a folder of stories that that I had taken apart in my head and seen how they were put together and that was does that ring a bell with you? Kind of, it's something that I'm doing now. Actually, I'm doing it a lot more now than than I did when I was younger, and I think that just comes from this kind of. Uh, from just this kind of movement in me to write. Like yeah. one of the quotes that I remember hearing early on, um, and I can't remember, it was from Alan Silito, he said, um, quantity builds quality. So if you write enough, eventually uh, you'll have something. <laughs> and I remember Pat McKay saying that to me when, uh, when I wrote my first book, you know, and I was kind of, and I said, well, you know, I've, I've 
I, I'd spent years and years and years at that stage writing magazine articles about, you know, 101 ways to style your hair this Christmas and uh, 12 steps to the perfect pedicure, you know, this kind of thing. And I, writing volumes, I mean, volumes of stuff every day, two, three, four thousand words a day of just like blah, blah, blah. I invented a male agony uncle called Andrew Tapster because I couldn't find a real male agony uncle. So I became him myself, you know, and I, so I did all of those things and I was, I was sort of not ashamed of them, but I didn't think they meant anything. You know, I was glad to be writing books and to be on this sort of, this kind of step up, you know. And uh, I, I remember McKay, Pat McKay, who was very kind to me early on, he said to me, all of that is words. All of it is structuring sentences, putting words together, expressing something. It's all the, you know, an amalgam of words, how words sit next to one another. And he said that is the best kind of training. And that's what I, that's something that I think is overlooked as well, is that it, it with, with people that want to write, you know, if you write, you're a writer. It doesn't matter if you're published or if you're not published. It doesn't matter if you're literary or commercial. It doesn't mean if you're good or bad. Writing, writers are people who sit down every day and write something. Yeah. You know? Like I have a really funny thing, like my mother is a writer and she writes notes, you know? And I remember my, my auntie Sheila coming to the house one day, the two of them, my mother had written, uh, Sheila was, my auntie Sheila was staying in the house, my mother had written a note saying, dear Sheila, uh, so and so has called for me and um, is driving me to Sissinghurst. Sissinghurst was the family home of Beta Sacker, and then this big long essay on Sissinghurst. And when she came home, Sheila had left a note next to it saying, A man rang. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the kind of a writer, and you know, that's how we function. We have to be writing. Yeah. And, um, I think isn't that one of the it, for me it, it's it's you know I, I'm sometimes asked about about what the what the what, what my gift what my my most valuable gift is and everything and uh, and um, you know you, you might talk about imagination and language and everything like that but but actually the skill and that the 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 that underwrites all of those things is turning up at the desk day after day after day and having the patience. And, and I've, I've always said that this is, I've always said that this is my, my, my most valuable asset as a writer is I have incredible patience. Mm. I have, I have kind of a stalker's patience. I can, I, I can, I know I can stalk <laughs> and I, I can stalk an idea for years. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and I have, I have, it means I come back to the desk day after day, and I have I have short stories in my last collection that that I've been polishing and chiseling at for ten years, and that um, and 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 you know you know this as as as, as well as I do, um, Marg, about that that you, you we teach we teach we teach students in their early twenties, and that and it can be incredibly difficult to teach the idea of patience because through no fault of their own, they live in a world of instant immediate, instant digital feedback. Yeah. And, and, um, and they live in a world of likes and, and, uh, and thumbs up and things like that. They get, yeah. and me, remember me, you know, me and you, we had to post letters and we had to wait for three months for a, for a typewriters, typewriters and things like that. So, it's one of the faculties, it's one of the waning faculties um, among a generation, and it's no fault of their own. It's the world that they've been handed on that, that, that patience is, is, uh, is one of the most difficult things you have to teach. Well, I, you know, it's funny, and I'm, I'm, I'm always, like, surprised by how different everyone is. Like, I would say that I have no patience. I very, very... Uh, low patience threshold but what I have got what my greatest asset is resilience do you know uh, so what happens to me is I fail and get up and fail and get up and fail and get up I rewrite a book um, I've you know I've rewritten books like 
seven times yeah. and had uh but at no point um would i I've, I've never had patience or uh, patience as much as resilience yeah i don't like waiting so if i had to rewrite a book i'll say diary like i wish i had patience i wish yeah. i had that thing of I, I write quickly, I work quickly, and I change, 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 change. And I think that's, I think that is a feature of the new writers coming through as well. That it's that, because I think patience and resilience are very, they're very close to each other. Do you yeah. know what I mean? They're kind of two sides of the same coin. Yeah. And they're both really, they're both necessary parts of being a writer being a writer they really are and but also at the center of it that it's it's I think it's how you enjoy writing yeah I think you enjoy the fallow thinking you know you can write stuff that I mean I remember hearing I remember you talking about solar bones you actually wrote that quite quickly didn't you yeah, well, I, I, you know, I, I actually have no memory of writing it. Uh, that's that's the truth. That's the God's truth, and and I mean that quite literally. I have no memory of writing it. Uh, there's a couple of reasons for that, uh, and I think the biggest one is that is that um, the morning I sent it off to Marianne, uh, I sent it off at half past two in the morning, and that same morning I became a father. Yeah, yeah. Um, amazing. So, so my 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 little boy and the book are, are the exact same age in that my my little boy comes between me and the book and and that's fine with me and that but um but but uh, it was it was a book that just kind of it kind of flowed through me i think and and um, i i i don't remember much about it i don't seem to have had the difficult hard hand-to-hand -hand fighting that i had with the previous novel with uh, with notes macoma which was just a really, a really difficult experience. It was like one spool and barbed wire. It just refused to almost, to, it refused to almost unspool at all. But mm -hmm. I managed to get it, managed to get it done in that. But I'm interested in, in how do you, how, how do you, how do you begin uh, a novel, Maureen? I, I begin with a character, or I begin with a, a, a voice. I hear a voice, or a, or a visual. Is, is that, is that your starting point? I think it's different for all of them. It's been very different. For all of them, I think what gets me. I, I'm 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 a rewriter, so what starts something like, say, for instance, um, you know, I wrote a book called The Lost Garden a few years ago, and th there was a piece of Irish history that I that I'd heard of years beforehand that really interested me. Uh, but the motivation to write the book actually was that I just finished writing a trilogy set in America and I had kept going over to America to research it. So when I wanted to write The Lost Garden, I said, I actually don't want to leave Mayo this year. So I'm going to write a book in Mayo, a Mayo book. And then this story popped into my head and then that became the beginning of it. But always for me, it becomes character. You know, the character is, I'm like, I'm doing, I'm, I don't know how many times I've rewritten the flipping book I'm writing at the moment. I just can't get hold of it. I've not been able to get hold of this relatively simple book idea that I'm writing at the moment, which is a mystery. And it's been through several rewrites and everything. And at the core of it, I didn't have my core character. And now I have her. Now I have my sleuth. But I've, it's taken me three rights of the book with the wrong sleuth. <laughs> which is like a really... So it's... One of the things that's exciting for me about writing now, and I'm 56, is that I'm constantly learning still. I'm like one of the students. Yeah. Um, and, I, you know, I really am. And that's one of the reasons that I love teaching is because, I don't know, maybe it's something about the way that I'm wired, but I need that information coming at me from all kinds of different, like for me, writing is a personal journey. It's a, it's a not, I don't write about me personally, but it's a journey of understanding myself as a writer, understanding myself as a person, understanding what works about writing, what doesn't work about writing, understanding voice, 
for me, teaching is a very um, two way street. The students wouldn't say that. They'd say like, I'm a complete dictator, which I am, <laughs> right? <laughs> but, you know, I look at their stuff sometimes and I, I'm looking at, I'm looking for their voice. Yeah. I think, I think they sense, I think there's sense of te- I think the sense of teacher in a room who's learning as well, and they and they they meet that halfway. Mm. Um, I I I I, th- I think they like the sense of being in of of that of that dual partnership of of uh, of teacher and student making something of a common discovery. Mm. And it was my own it was my own motivation for for getting into into teaching as well. Is I I was three books deep, and I wanted to rethink. I wanted to rethink what I had done and I wanted to rethink where I was going to go. And I, and I wasn't altogether certain that I would do it on my own if I was left on my own and that, but if I had to do it for other people in teaching, then I knew I definitely would do it. Yeah. So that was, that was what kind of, that was what kind of, kind of drew me into it. And I was very, I was very impressed by a, a, my reading in, in university had been, my philosophy reading had been Heidegger. And, and he was always he was always adamant that he says he was always adamant that if a teacher is doing his job uh, in a classroom, he actually is the one who's doing the most learning. <laughs> that uh, he seemed to think that students were beside the point, not quite yeah. that radical, but he, he seemed to believe that 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 a good teacher was the one doing the most learning in a classroom, yeah. and that was that was. I wouldn't like to think there was that great of an imbalance in the classroom, yeah. but I certainly would like to think that that I was getting uh, something from it as well. Um, yeah, so it's the same as with me. It's with me. It's it's. Um, I was I was in my in my twenties. I I hung out with artists. I didn't meet a writer until I was about thirty years of age, and I hung out with artists, and I got a, and I got a I got a visual education. And um, on account of that, an awful lot of my beginnings have visual beginnings. Mm. Um, a man blundering around a kitchen. Um, like, why is he blundering around? And then you, the, the image recurs again and again, and you see, why is he blundering around his kitchen? Who is he? It's the middle of the day. How come he's not at work? And this, when you get an image like that, you begin yeah. to interrogate it, ask it questions. And if you stay with it long enough, it, it will it will give you answers. And that's always my that's always my starting point is these is these kind of almost solitary characters yeah. in in rooms are uh, and they're always it's always pitched in Lewisburg. All the you know, the pull yeah. the pull and the steering of my pen is yeah. all towards Lewisburg and that. And, and and once and once and once I'm there, anything can happen. I've no difficulty with going. Yeah or with dystopian experiments or anything like that but it's like I need it's like I need the fields of Lewisburg and the crossroads and the little town I need that sol- solidity under my feet and then I can go stone mad then anything can happen after that. You know it's interesting as well because what I found is that because I, I had a big sea change um, a couple of years ago with, with my writing and um, I, I, I was struggling to write and I write, I had been writing things that were set in the past and things, I, I was actually, I was writing a book set in the world of magazines in London in the 1980s, which is a great setting for me. I mean, it was just perfect, but I just couldn't get into it. And I was starting to find work very arduous. And I went through this personal experience where I stopped and I just went, is this it? Like, have I finished? Am I going to give this up? I'm not enjoying writing anymore. What's going on? And I went through, I went on this little journey where I kind of studied myself and thought, are you losing the will to write? It wasn't a writer's block. It was just, I was writing stuff and I just, I wasn't feeling it. You know, I should have been, but I wasn't. And what I realized was that I was being very drawn to like non-fiction. I've always written a bit of non-fiction in newspaper articles. What I realized was I don't want to leave where I am. I don't want to, it's too far to go. I was in a particular space at my family. I had a young son, my family. I wanted to be in my house in Kalala with my family. I wanted to be there for my son. 
who I felt needed me. And so every day when I went into this journey in my imagination, it was literally too far. I was going away too far into this other world that had always been my savior, my imagination, this other world, America in the 1920s or London in the 1980s. And I stopped and I thought, I don't wanna go there anymore. I wanna be where I am. And so I started working again on stories I thought, where do I want to be? And I thought, right here, right now. So I started writing um, books set in the present day, in a small town, in Ireland. And that's what I'm working on at the moment. <laughs> Everything I'm writing is right now, do you know? And I think sometimes it's, it's things like that that fascinate me about writing is that you can... You can you can you can change things around if something's yeah. not working, find something else. And that for me is the resilience and the patience of being a writer. Yeah. Sometimes it's easy and sometimes it's not. And it's what you're willing, how committed you are to the process and how passionate you are about producing stuff and being creative to kind of just take it that extra, take it the extra mile, you know. Did you say that? Did you say there that you were having that you kind of had trouble with your central character, with your sleuth? Because yeah, what you what you said there sounds awful familiar to what I was I was sort of lucky enough to be one of the last people to interview John McGahern for his for his for the the archive in NUI mm -hmm. Galway, and and he told me a story about how he had worked on amongst women he'd worked on it for about five years or something like that and for the first three years of his writing on that book um the center of the book were the three sisters and that 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 was the center of the book and he said it just kept going round and round in circles on him he couldn't make it work mm. and and all of a sudden uh, and out the corner of his eye there was this man in his top coat over and oh. waving at him saying no 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 over here over here and, and and he and when he once he brought him in and put him in the middle of the pitch and gave him the ball yeah the, the whole the whole thing the whole thing, it, the whole thing changed for him and, and and it made sense he it, it, no he didn't regret the time spent doing it he felt that that was what was necessary to him you know and he he, he was a patient writer and that so the story of the story of, of being kind of drawn into different avenues and, and that is was pretty familiar to, I think it's pretty yeah. familiar to a lot of writers and that, yeah. It's funny because I find that as old, I mean, I've been writing like yourself, I've been writing for like all, all my adult life really. So I started profession, I was 19, when I, 18 or 19 when I got my first piece published. And I think as I'm getting older, um, I am developing more patience for it, but it's very much like the old dog for the long road. Yeah. Do you know? Yeah. It really is like a long, and by the time um, you, but by the time we're in a position where we have the money, uh, uh, you know, to get the accolades or to get, and we've got the award and all the rest of it, usually it doesn't really matter anymore. Yeah. <laughs> My mother's like, I won an award like a, a over in London for uh, the romantic novelist thing. And my mother keeps saying, where is it? And I'm like, oh, it's in a box in Hendon. Do you know, it's in, I, I never bought it at home. Like when I was younger, that would have been very important to me. But now it's less. And they're like, I'm not an award winner like you either. But I find that but I'm I'm much more willing to kind of settle into the doing of it, to enjoy the doing of it. Yeah. And, well, you know what? People are looking at the the, the thing that I'm writing at the moment, and um, why, why is it taking so long? And why are you like I'm not writing the great Irish novel. I'm writing a series of murder mysteries. <laughs> but I'm kind of it's changing, and it's kind of become a much more long-winded process than a lot of people would expect but I'm enjoying it yeah. and the, the, the outcome of it is, is, in a, is much less important to me than it used to be. And I think from, 
a, you know, and a writing career for me, it started off in this big fizz and then it's gone up and down, up and down and then flattened. But I feel now that I'm getting older, that I'm getting a bit of the fizz back. I mean, do you feel that? Because Solar Bones like was just like such a, such a huge, great big. Yeah. Like, but I, I, you, you feel like, oh, it's all over now, like whatever. <laughs> no, but you, you make a really good point there is that, is that for writers, a splashy debut is, is, is actually the easy part in some ways. It's the long, middle ground middle career that that's where the that's where the real slog is and that and then and then all of a sudden then people turn around to you and say oh geez you're great and they start patting you on the back and telling mm. you that you're a great lad and a great woman and that and, and it's, it's interesting what you were saying about about winning winning awards and things like that they tend to matter more to other people than they, than they, than they do to yourself and mm. no, none of the awards I, I, I've received like made me a better writer <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but uh, but actually apparently it did in other people's eyes with that mm. um so yeah so that's um that's that's uh, that's where that's where it is at the moment I'm, I'm writing away i the last thing i i write the books that i write the books that come to me uh more i go um and i i don't i don't i don't i'm not programmatic uh, they, they all tend to be set in the west of ireland i don't know if that will expire uh, I don't, but I do have one kind of self-conscious project, um, one deliberate project, and and it's a. Uh, I've always wanted to write a science fiction novel set in the west of Ireland. Um, I, I, I've I've always wondered does did Ireland does the west of Ireland have a future, as a science fiction, um, locale, and um, so I I I. So I have a handful. I have a handful of short stories towards towards um, my science fiction West of Ireland, and um, I'd love to write a. I'd love to write a science fiction novel on, on the West of Ireland. So fingers crossed. Maybe that'll. Maybe that will happen. <laughs> I'm just breaking there, my friend. Better hurry up before one of the students does it. Yeah, they're very good. They are very good. Yeah. I just want to remind everybody we've got about 15 minutes left. So if anybody does have any questions, um, now would be the time to put it in the chat function. Uh, guys, just you give us a good overview there of your careers and um, both of you are, I don't know how many books in, but significant numbers. What advice would you give to writers starting out um, in terms of getting on the publishing ladder? Uh, any good tips? Uh, well, shall I start? With, yeah, yeah. I, sure. I, I would say the first thing to do is to write every day. I think there's different there's different ways of writing. There's different types of writers. Um, I would be like I said, I'm a hack. I'm a jobbing writer. So um, for getting in terms of uh, getting published and uh, becoming a writer, that I'd say go. The big thing now is to go multi platform. So, you know, if you're sitting writing a literary novel, I would just say write every day, try and get an agent. Um, writing literary novels, you need to be really doing something different. Do you know what I mean? Um, it's, it's very, you know, it's, it's getting more and more difficult. Um, but with literary writers, there's a lot of um, kind of managed, um, kind of crowdfunding publishing houses that are very good. Mike can name me one. What's the name of the big one in London? One of our own students works in that house and I, I know it won't come to me at the moment. I know the one oh, you're, I, I know the one. That's you're... going to annoy me now, I can't remember. But if you Google crowdfunding websites um, for literary work, that's good. For younger writers, I would say collaborate. Um, you know, like, um, uh, my, my my little boy Tomo, he's he's eleven and he just says he wants to be writer. One of the things that I would be teaching young writers now is to get together, get into groups, collaborate, work on multi-platform things. You know, if you're writing um, a, a, a fantasy novel, um, make friends with game designers, make friends with illustrators, make friends with other young people. That things are really now global. It's not just about books anymore, do you know? And, but I, I, would, I would say 
write every day. That would be my main personal thing is just get up every day and write, make that time. I've met so many writers over the years who have made it work, who have two jobs. Um, I met an engineer up in um, one of the uh, writers retreats and he's, uh, he lives in a small, tiny little, I wanna say Monaco, but it's even smaller than Monaco. Tiny little, really gorgeous tax haven country somewhere in Europe, I think it begins with an A. Anyway, he's a best-selling writer, but it's a tiny country. And he gets up every morning and he writes between six and eight every day. And he get, knocks out a book a year and he's the best-selling Andorra He's the best Andorra, but he does it in two hours in the morning. And if you can make that commitment, that's that's the biggest commitment. And then go and get yourself the writer's and artist's handbook and troll through it. I would I would agree. I would agree. Get to the table, build up the muscle and the stamina necessary. I I often think that that writing is like is like. A, People have no difficulty in learning to play football and learning to become marathon runners and that. They turn up and they practice day after day after that. And writing is, you, you're born with a degree of talent and then you're, it's, you, there's a responsibility on you to turn up at the desk and bring it that far, bit further by sheer dint of work alone. Mm. And that's the most important thing. And and more, I guess, right. If you if you got into two hours a day, two and a half to three hours a day, you you can you you have a clear conscience after that. Uh, it's it's uh, you've done your bit. Um, and then if uh, for a practical reason, when, once you have your work done, once you have your first short stories and your work done, I'd go to a website called writing.ie, mm. writing.ie, and and that'll give you an overview of the ecology of magazines and short story competitions and publishers that are out there. I don't know who runs that thing, but it is just the best. And Ezra Lachlan, yeah, it's a really, really good website. It's, it's kind of it's kind You know, the other thing is, is that you can, if it, again, depending on what you're writing, but it's all, you know, you can learn or you can get all of that stuff online. There's place to submit short stories. If you're writing commercial fiction, um, and popular fiction as well. Um, you know, you can go to events, meet agents, you know. Um, but I think the most important thing as well is to just to just kind of keep at it. Yeah. And decide that it's decide that it's important enough that it's part of your life. There's this one my one of my favorite quotes is from this American short story writer called Grace Paley. It was very brilliant. She was also a creative writing teacher. And she was interviewed, I don't know, in the Paris Review or somewhere, somewhere like that. And they said, well, Grace, what is the most important thing that you think that a writer needs um, to be successful? You know, or to, to, to write something really brilliant, you know, is it imagination, is it, you know, patience or whatever, what is it? And she thought for a moment and she said, low overheads. And that is so true. <laughs> like, if, if you can create a life, if you're, um, if you want, you know, a big house and lots of money and handbags and going out and all of that stuff, don't become a writer, do you know? Be, build, make a life or build a life that will enable you to write, do you know? Yeah. Um, a lot of my students leave, they have very simple jobs, they write in their spare time. They have security, they write in their spare time, do you know? They have a writing shed at their parents' house where they can go. You kind of need to build a life that works around it. You know. Thanks, Morag. You can take that time. Susan has joined us uh, from the Ballina French Festival. And Susan, you have some questions, I think. I do. Thank you both. Um, I have a question, first of all, from Jennifer. And Jennifer asks, does helping students with their own plots ever inspire your own writing? Oh, my God. Uh, no, for me, I, there, there, there might have been a time, uh, Jennifer, when it did inspire me. There might have been a time when, when I was 
10, 15 years ago when I was when I was um, I was of their age, I was going to the same movies and reading the same books as them, even listening to the same albums. But it happens really quickly and suddenly that you get old and um, and all of a sudden I, I, I don't recognize the plots and I don't recognize the movies and I don't recognize the albums or the actors and that like a, a colored actor that died there. A black actor died there a couple of weeks ago and the whole world was talking about him and I never knew who I didn't, he <gasps> didn't it doesn't mean anything to me. And you know, I I've fallen so so out of out of out of kind of cultural just fallen away from it and that. So no they don't, but they're, they're not now, not anymore. There was a time when it when it could have happened, but uh, not anymore, no. I get very excited. I have a new function this week, and I, I think I said to one of the girls, uh, I, th I said to one of my students this week, if you don't write that bloody book, I'm going to. I often threaten them and say, that is such a good idea, like, please write that book. Uh, because I think sometimes the books that we want to write, or that we, when, when we're young writers, we have this idea of, I want to write this certain sort of book, I want it to be full of meaning, and I want it to be very important, I want it to be very clever. And sometimes that's not the book that you should be writing. Do you know? Yeah. Well, that's not the book that suits your writing the best. Yeah. And, uh, so sometimes, you know, you, you'll see, like, Ed is an example. One of my wives a few years ago, he came in with an incredible idea for a sci-fi novel. It was amazing. Sat him down, went out for coffee. said, what's the story with you? A mature student. He said, well, he said, I've spent the last 10 years as a private detective. And I went, what? And I said, look, put the sci-fi novel to one side and please write me a private detective novel. And he went, really? And I said, yes. And now that's what he's doing. And actually we're working together on a project at the moment. So often I will, I will look at students' ideas and I'll think, oh my gosh, that's amazing. And I'll, I'll think that's, I, they're ideas that I could never come up with. Yeah. They're also books that I could never write. And I, I'm still get so frustrated at the idea that there's this great idea out there. And this person might never write it, you know, and they might never finish it. I've, I, yeah, I've had a handful of students in in my time on that, and that 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 I've gone. How the hell did they do that? That is just so good. And I, I've, you know, there's there's one or two students in my in my MA class at the moment, and I go, damn, that is so good. I wish I was, but it's not me. It's not what I I could envy it. And I could, and I can salute it in someone else, but I know it's not me. And that doesn't stop me being being excited by it or anything like that. Thanks, guys. The next question in is from Bob, and Bob asks, "Do you write what interests you, or what interests a large chunk of readers, or a bit of both?" I don't know what interests what? me. If it doesn't interest me, I I I I couldn't possibly write it. I just would be. I would as a journalist. I did it for long enough as a journalist, step by step, the perfect manicure. No, I won't do that anymore. Just it has to interest me. That's same. That's the same answer for me. If it, I just couldn't be, I just couldn't be. But I and I try to write. I try to write a book that I'd want to read myself in some ways. I think you know. I couldn't. Uh, there's always that thing like write the book you'd want to read yourself. Yeah. Um, but or, it's also. I think it's a fallacy that commercial fiction writers write for money. They don't. They just happen to make money writing what they love. You know, any of them. Yeah. There are no writers that sit down and say, I'm going to write this book and make loads of money and write specifically for an audience in order to make money. They really don't. They do it because they because they love it. Otherwise, it would be yeah. terribly hard. Yeah. Thank you. Next question is from Trisha. And Trisha says, it's great listening to you both. And she enjoys scribbling short wee stories for enjoyment. And she's wondering when and how do you know if it's time to take it further? Uh, I, this is one I get. This is one I get is how do you know? How do you make the differentiation between what's a short story and what's, what wants to grow up to be a novel and that? For me, it's a sense of space and possibility opening out. I have a very kind of defined sense of a. I have a very kind of a defined sense of borders in my in in. I suppose through through about a quarter century of writing now, I have a very definite sense of borders, and that, um, 
But I would say I would say to that that a very definite sense of borders, and so I know that that these things are going. This is going to be a short story. This is going to be a short story. But I, I would say to you, I, I would say to your to your to your friend there, that um, if she starts writing a novel, and she's also if she's and she's also kind of um, dabbling with short stories at the same time, um, she won't run up against that problem because if, if she gives herself over to one novel at a time, everything else after that will be short stories while she's writing the novel and that she, she um, it won't be a question that will, will bother her too much. I think uh, novels tend to, novels tend to consume all your energy. They, t- they suck up all the light around you and they, <laughs> and who was it, John McGregor or something that is, is it's like, you know, writing a novel and having a novel reviewed is like, climbing out of a car crash after three years and people start holding up scorecards for you. <laughs> That's a great car crash. You did well getting out of that. Yeah. Um, I think it's also, I think it depends what, what kind of writing you're doing. I think a lot of people write for pleasure. And then what happens is they amass, I don't know, a big lump of Facebook posts or a big lump of little things that they've written, maybe for pleasure or family history um, and that they want to do something with, but they don't necessarily have the outlet. You know, it's not necessarily a short story or it's not necessarily, you know. Um, and I, I come up, you know, uh, a lot of people come and talk to me about that. And I say, you know, if you have a body of work that you're proud of, that you're happy with, that you want to do something with, consider self-publishing it. There are so many out. There are so many um, outlets now, not necessarily to sell your work, but just to produce something. Do you know and sell it locally? One of the one of the loveliest things I ever did a few years ago is I, uh, my auntie Sheila, who wrote a lot for Sandy Miscellany and um, Island Zone, and had had poetry published in various places, but she was never going to it was never going to move on into writing a novel or she had this body of work. And so I worked with her and we self-published it. Um, we sold it in local bookshops, local in Ballina and local where she lived down at Bamoy. Um, we had a wonderful event in Ballina Art Centre together and this lovely, and it gave so much pleasure to us, to our family. Um, and to our circle of friends and to people who had known Sheila through the years. And she got very nice sales in Ballina, very nice sales in Fumoy. But she also had the sense of having been able to produce this, this book and that, what, that there was a record of what she had written. And people can be quite snooty about the idea of self-publishing, but it's now, it's now an option that's out there an affordable option that's out there for people. So I would say if you have a bunch of work, Trish, and want to do something with it, you can, you, you can do that. You can, you know, you can send it off to have it published, but you can also produce something yourself. Great, thank you very much. The next question is from Tom. And Tom asks, when the story Gremlins attack and you get stuck in a rut, what methods do you use to kickstart again? For me, I take the character aside and for me, I take the character aside and I write the character's name. I, I take, a, I take a, a, a completely pristine set, page of paper uh, and I, I take a pristine page of paper. I, I use this type of, um, this is big A4 copy and I, I write longhand. And this is, and I take, and, and when, I, when I buy these copies, the first thing I do is I take my pliers to them and I take out the I take out the, the staples in it and so I so I take out the center sheets and I work on the center sheets and I I write the character's name along the top and I ask it questions. I ask the characters questions. Who is it? This is Mike McCormick. Mike McCormick is what age? He is 55 years of age. What, what's what are his circumstances? He is married with a child and that. Um, and what does he work at? He works as an engineer. And where's he working? He works in Kesselbar. And uh, what does he do? What does he like doing? Well, he likes prog rock. Uh, and uh, does he does he like and uh, does he like does he like he goes for walks? And all I keep asking it questions and asking it questions. Does he have 
things that are important to him? Does he have items of clothing? Does he have a watch or a pen knife or something that's important to him? I keep asking questions like that, delving into the background, and I will, I will, I will find that it's that that's that's an important question, and, and I found it to be a valuable device um, because it will happen at some time during every project is that I will start spinning my wheels and it really is a case of me taking the central character aside and asking him questions or her questions as the case may be so that's that's my way of getting out of it and that I and do I exactly find... the same thing on a whiteboard yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. it's there because the imp I move around a lot I draw um, I like I do like charts and stuff like that, mind mapping, um, write, writing out the characters, mapping um, their entire families, their entire histories. Uh, I think the, impo uh, uh, the important thing is if you're stuck, uh, just move, move somewhere, you know, make a cup of tea, write, or just try and change your methods, draw something. Yeah. Do you know shit? What's up? Watch something on the television. Yeah. Do you know I, get into something on the television and just kind of get the brain, get yeah. it moving again. Sitting looking at the blank page is just. I've I've done that. I've gone out in the brought brought some, you know, go into town and sit in a coffee shop or even go get into the car and drive to the sea and bring the notebook with you and do it there. I, you know, as my father used to say, a change of grass is always good for us and that. Yeah. 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 That's uh, keep keep things mixed up like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Next question. We've just two more here now from Shiva. Uh, when you write, do you have the ending at the back of your mind from the beginning, or do you just gradually get there? That's a good question. I think. For me, it's I've done it both ways. Mm -hmm. I have started a book. The last story I the last story I I wrote there, it's, it's about three and a half thousand words long I didn't know how it was going to end when I started and um, I started it and um, it threw up a, what I think is a pretty good ending I'm pretty happy with it on that um, but most uh, and um, but that came as a surprise to me um, I knew the ending of Notes from a Coma I knew the ending of it before I knew the beginning I knew the first scene and I knew the last scene and it was just the 200 pages in between that I didn't really know that much about and that and um, so I had that I had the book bracketed uh, before I before I started writing it and that um, and so but sometimes for me writing is is a mode of discovery I'm not writing about anything I'm writing towards something towards a final conclusion or an end sentence or something but one of the things that's one of the things that's about compositional method and everything is that there is no right way, but there is a right way for you. And there might even be a right way for that book that you're working on. And you have to find it in that. And, and some people go about it really differently. I mean, you know, P.D. James is one, you know, um, the great, one of the great crime writers and a and, uh, brilliantly insightful and intelligent woman. And, that, and she was saying like this, she spends three months of every year just plotting characters moving them around and adjusting their circumstances and then she writes the book once she has the plot in place then she writes the book ken bruin ken bruin morag tells a tells an absolutely brilliant story about tells a brilliant story about an american crime writer thing i forget the name of the crime writer now but he he said I'm, i met him at a crime convention in in boston and he said he said to me that he, he says come on back he says i've got a bottle in the house we'll we'll make a night of it and that so he says, oh, yeah, sure. So he walks back to, he goes back to his flat and he th throws open the door, big, luxurious flat. And in the middle, in the first thing he sees is, he says, it's a whiteboard. And mm. he says, it's about 15 foot square. Mm. And he says, there's nothing on it but names and arrows and dates mm. and notes and everything. And he says, it's like a fucking board you'd see at NASA. Mm. And your man, and your man, your man with no smile on his face, he looked at him and he said, do you think will it work? <laughs> he, said, <laughs> he said, he said, he said, he said he had it all mapped out. He says, I never saw anything so foreign in all yeah. my life. Yeah. But he says, this man, 
he this, that's, this exactly, what, what, that's what I do. That's what I'm doing at the moment. Yeah. And it's a new thing for me. Like I used to be, I used to sit and write, but now I'm doing a different kind of thing and I love it. And I'm doing TV plots. Or, and that, that that's what I have. I'm building these huge uh, whiteboards. So I am, I love structure and plot. I enjoy it as part of the process. And uh, so I don't always have the end. Like funnily enough, uh, you know, I can, sometimes I have the end and the beginning and like that. But I need, um, you know, there's this saying that, uh, you, you know, you can jump out the window and grow wings on the way down. Uh, and some people don't grow wings. You know, some people like me, I just jump out the window and then I go splat. And I get up and I go splat. Then I get up and I go splat. And eventually I just said, you know what, more I build yourself one of those little window cleaning pulleys. And that's the structure. And I kind of get into that. And so I have the whole thing plotted uh, from the get go. And then if, and I, I can't proceed until I have that done. Once I proceed, then it can all change and the ending can change. Was it all? I need, I need the little, I, need, I can't jump out the window anymore. I'm too old and I've been battered too many times. So now I kind of, but then of course you go to people and you say, will it work? and nobody knows yeah yeah <laughs> until you get it until you get into it you know yeah yeah but Last if you question. ending do that just plot the whole thing out william hague plot structure h-a-g-u-e google him he's a well, he's, he's a, an expert on plot structure i i i it wouldn't be one of my strengths and i have a great admiration for i have a great admiration for for writers who can write plots. And that's why I would share an admiration for P.G. Woodhouse because his 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 plots were just brilliant. They were so twisty, turny and- I, don't, I doubt he ever planned them out. I wouldn't think he'd have had time. Do you I know? Would, uh, yeah. I, 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 I think- Agatha Christie would have, plotted, would have plotted everything very carefully. Jane yeah. Rowling plots things meticulously. Does she, yeah. She does, yeah, she does like, huge charts and oh yeah the whole bit and yeah. I always have done you know I remember writing something once and um it was uh, another writer rang me and they said what are you doing I said I'm plotting a book and I said I the whole thing is on one page and the boys are blue and the girls are pink and the subsidiary characters are green and the narrator is black and then I hold it back like that and check that it's primarily pink and I start writing. So it's a lot of, yeah, it's everyone does it differently, you know? Yeah, I, I work with, I work with um, sketches as well of, of the, when, when I was writing notes from a coma, I had, um, I, I had, um, because I was dealing with six or seven narrators and that I had to, I, I color coded my narrators and, yeah. and, and I was seeing Okay, I haven't heard from Mr. Blue in quite a while. He's yeah. dropped out of he's dropped out of the reckoning. So I have yeah. to bring him have to bring them back in, or the novel yeah. will be lopsided in that. And again, it's one of the it's it's partially one of the things that that um, I see my I see my novels not just as not just as continuous lengths of prose, but as constructs, as three dimensional constructs on that, or multi dimensional constructs. But it's how that. people construct. Mm. It, it, people construct in different ways. I construct before, because, and it, it's right. I keep saying writing is personal. It's really a reflection of your personality. Mike and I write in really, really different ways, but we come to the same conclusion in the end, which is a finished book, which is a story. Yeah. Do you know? It's it's how it, it, you find whatever way works for you. And that's that's actually one of the that's actually one of the things that and students will never get graded on it and they never actually think that it's an important lesson but I think it is after they spend a year with us more I one of the things they should know is something about their own compositional technique is what suits them and that there's no there's no right way there's no right way for everyone but there is a right way for you and the you, book yeah. you're on at the time and that and and uh, it's 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 our kind of wish that. They, they would discover their voice and they would discover their own compositional techniques and that, yeah. And, and what's right for them isn't right for us. 
Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's very important as a teacher that you don't press yourself on them and that you don't, that you don't uh, lean on them to, 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 to or assume uh, that your way is the way. Your way is the way. Yeah. Yeah. Last question, guys, from the audience, uh, from Connor. In your opinion, what are the most important technical and literary devices used in short stories? In short stories, I think that for me, in the, the most important thing about a short story is that, and it goes back to the, the first, the, one of the great 19th century practitioners, was Edgar Allan Poe, is that there should be no waste and that everything in the short story should contribute to the unity of overall effect, uh, that every everything in, in the short story should have a job to do, and it should contribute to the to its own to a unified, gem-like impression. One of what we love about the short story is that you can hold it up in your mind's eye, you can turn it around, it's faceted like a jewel, and all its internal components should contribute to that. Uh, shaped jewel like definition at the end and that now the novel is a, a novel is an ungovernable animal and that's why we love it as well it's it's a the big you know the novel the novel thrives on waste and on detours and on digressions and all that well the short story no the most important thing about the short story is that everything in it must contribute to a unity of over a unity of effect i agree <laughs> what he said. <laughs> okay, if there's no more questions, Susan, um, probably time to wrap it up. Uh, I'd just like to thank Mike and Morag. Um, you've been so generous, guys, sharing these insights into the writer's life. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks to Susan for doing the questions. Um, thank you, everybody, for attending. And uh, just like to remind you that there are still a few more days of the Ballina Fringe Festival. Um, for details of all of the events, which are almost all online, uh, go to our website, which is ballinafringefestival.ie. And just a reminder that the non-online events uh, are the drive-in movies on Saturday. So we're showing The Princess Bride. And this is Spinal Tap, so an eclectic double bill, if ever. Uh, and you can get the tickets on the website as well. So thanks for joining in. And Where's the drive-in movie, Sean? Where is it? Sorry, Mike? Where is the drive-in movie? In the Mart in Ballina. Uh, no, really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I thought maybe you were doing it in the Arts Centre. You're doing it up in the Mart. Up in the Mart, so <laughs> movies at the Mart. When is Spinal Thank Tap you. on, on Saturday? They're both on Saturday. Um, Princess Bride is six p.m. Spinal Tap is nine p.m. And, and what's and, and how many how, how many cars will be there? How many like come in? I think we can hold about fifty cars. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, so, and has it been good. has it been successful and well well subscribed in that? Uh, tickets are going well, but there are still some available. Good. So anybody who hasn't got theirs, do oh, so promptly. The Princess Bride, good, though, yeah. Yeah, the Princess Bride is a great crowd pleaser, isn't it? Yeah. It is, yeah. Cracking story and everything. <laughs> so it should be good. Yeah. Okay, so, so thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks more egg. Always hey, great work with you. Good to see good to see you, Mike. You too, and take care of yourself. All right. Hey, Susan you. and Sean, thanks a million. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Susan, thanks a million. Thanks, guys.